Yes. It, it, it's quite, quite uh, serendipitous. It, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's been a godsend for me in terms of helping me focus and understand what's the message that can impact on a vast, large percentage of people and guide them into healthier lifestyles and um, higher quality of life and and uh, uh, all right doc sorry to interrupt i'm sorry for the delay we're good to go hello hello it's tuesday and it's facebook live and i'm so privileged to introduce my guest to you but before i do it's four o'clock pacific five o'clock here in costa rica seven o'clock on the east coast midnight in london 1 a.m. in Milan, Warsaw, and most of Europe, 4.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in New Delhi, 9 o'clock a.m. in Brisbane, 11 o'clock a.m. Wednesday in Auckland, and it's Facebook Live. And <laughs> <laughs> it always tickles me to have people from around the world, so thank you so much. Please shout out a hello here and tell us where you're from and what time is it there. I think I've got it right now. I'm cheating. I'm using my, my iPhone so that I get the times right. Uh, but thank you so much for being here. And my privilege today is to introduce you to my primary mentor in my healthcare life, uh, the man who, um, by how he lives his life and his message, guided my mind into developing a focus so that I could talk about the things that really gave me passion for the last 40 years, actually 40 years since 1978. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland is the co-founder of the Institute for Functional Medicine. And um, he and his wife started all of this and really gave us the framework by which to hold this concept that how we live our lives has the largest contribution most of the time to how our bodies are functioning. And that seems like a basic 101, but for most of us, we've grown up believing it's okay you know, to have some of the things that are on television market like tricks are for kids. Tricks. Tricks are for kids. Well, when I learned that tricks was 50% sugar, that each teaspoon of tricks was 50% sugar, I asked my wife, please don't ever buy that again. And we didn't, you know, so functional medicine is the, the guideline for all of us into how do we think about where the this problem has come from. So I could go on and on, but with that, let me say welcome and many, many thanks to you, Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, for being here today. Well, Tom, let me just take a second to reciprocate by saying that I remember so vividly uh, when I first met you, which was, I think, at a seminar in Chicago. This would have been back, as you said, 40 years ago. And Immediately, um, we were both a little younger, 40 years ago, but immediately I could see that you just had not only an active mind, but a pursuit of excellence and a insatiable thirst to understand more so you could help your patients. It came across almost immediately. And, you know, I think as you've now grown up to become a leader and to become a person that now has many people learning from you, I'm sure you know exactly when you meet these kind of people, like when I met you, that you recognize a moment of time spent with them is going to pay huge dividends because they're going to take the ball and run. They've got the inner drive. They've got the fire in the belly. Their motivation is to find way of really capitalizing on helping people. And um, I just want to honor that moment some 40 years ago, because for both of us, it's led not only to a great friendship, but a lot of mutual synergy in the way that we have uh, sparked our energy into hopefully helping lots of people help themselves to be healthier. Amen. Amen to all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, and Jeff, I think you know that it was 10 years ago that I made a declaration that I was going to interview the world's greats in the world of celiac disease and wheat-related disorders. 
And I went out and I interviewed all these people around the world. My first interview was Michael Marsh at Oxford, and he had never been interviewed. And this is the godfather of celiac disease. And, and I rem still remember he took me around Oxford arm in arm and said, now, Tom, that's where I sat here at the library for so many years to study. That was my seat. And that's where I st stood on stage to receive my medical degree. And it was, it was a wonderful experience for the first wow. interview ever. And we put on the Gluten Summit and you were a part of that. And it was 10 years ago. And that was the first online health summit that ever occurred. And um, I hired a couple of people uh, individually to help me with this. There was this guy who called me and said, uh, hi, I'm the social media director of the University of Chicago Celiac Center. And uh, I'm out in California. Would you like to have breakfast? And I said, sure. And I told him what I was going to do. I just made the declaration a couple of days beforehand. And I said, why don't you join me? And he said, all right, that sounds really exciting. And he did. And then I called our friend JJ Virgin and said, I need somebody to help me with the internet stuff to carry this message out. And she introduced me to the president of Infusionsoft and he routed me to a guy named Bobby. And so Bob and Bobby, I hired them individually and we figured out how to do this thing. We figured it out and you know they'd call me and say, hey, we got a real problem. And that's, that's, I, well, I don't know, you, you guys figure it out. I'm doing the interviews, you do the rest <laughs> of it. <laughs> and the result was it was a very successful event. Um, and uh, we, we had 118,000 people that attended. Uh, nothing like that had ever been done before. And as a result, our friends like Mark, Mark Hyman, and uh, Deanna Minnick and James Masco, they all called me and said, how did you do that? How do you, we want to do that. And I said, well, I don't know. We just made it up. And I, they asked, can I talk to your team? And I said, sure, of course. So then my team got back to me and said, doc, your friends want to do this same kind of thing. We should start a company to do this. And I said, that's not my passion, you know, but you guys have my blessing. We did great. Go, go forth. And Health Talks Online was founded as a result of that, that it was the Gluten Summit that did that, uh, that created all of that. And now tens of millions of people have been helped. And I say that a little out of pride, but also because it's a 10 year anniversary and I'm going to be doing another event. And I'm going to reach out to you afterwards by in email and see if we can coordinate a time uh, for an interview. Uh, but with well, all, let, let, all let, let me that, let me just jump in here by saying, you know, it's uh, as they say, chance favors the prepared mind. Yeah. So Tom O'Brien, Dr. Tom O'Brien, had been preparing himself for that ten years before. Uh, you, you didn't, didn't suddenly come up with an idea and say, oh, I'm going to read a bunch of articles on gluten and, and I'm going to interview some people and then I'm going to do this. You had been on a trajectory uh, as an insatiable learner to try to assemble information in ways that no one else had ever assembled it. And I, I think back, and I'm very proud to say that you and I shared the podium on several years of seminars to practitioners in which you and I both were gaining our skills, right? We were learning our discipline to, to know where to put our energy. And I think it wasn't just fortuitous and happen chance uh, that you ultimately initiated what has probably been regarded as the most successful uh, experience of its type. So uh, I think this concept of preparing ourselves for the, uh, the ability to be present and do the heavy lifting it's just not flight of, of fancy. You don't just jump in and become an expert overnight. Well, thank you for that. And that's exactly a great lead in as to why we're here tonight and about the immune system and about how do we prepare ourselves so that we have quality of life in our senior years. I think for me, that's a primary and for many, many people so that our, our trajectory of how our bodies function for us, stay at a good high level with a very short period of disability so that we don't have the uh, roller coaster of getting 
less functional, less functional, less functional, and then be diagnosed with the disease and then eventually in a nursing home. But rather we've got good vital function until our time comes whenever that is. And I know that part of the message coming out of the summit is your immune system is critical to that. So can, can we start there? How does a well-functioning immune system contribute to quality of life in our senior years? Well, thank you. And, and really, again, uh, to give you one last bit of uh, homage for the, for the contribution you made, we have done this uh, Immunity Solutions Summit now, starting it last year, following in Dr. Tom O'Brien's model. And we were really amazed at how many people were interested in participating in that program. Uh, it wasn't 118,000, but it was tens of thousands. And we're now in the second year of the Immunity Solutions uh, Summit, and we're getting even greater traction this year. So it demonstrates to me that there is an unmet need there, that people do want to know more about their immune system. And I think for good reason, because it turns out that our immune system is much more than just protecting against flu and colds and SARS. Our immune system is working 24 seven in virtually every organ of our body to seek and, and destroy and repair damage and to rejuvenate cells and, and tissues and to keep us young and healthy. It has an active participatory role in never going to sleep. <laughs> it's like our heart. It's, it's beating all the time to, um, to seek out places where it should do repair. And that led to a term that we coined about uh, now going on four years ago, that at the time people said, well, Jeff, you're always making up words. You know, here's another Jeff Blandism. Uh, do we really need another word? But I think it's now starting to get some traction. The, the word is immunorejuvenation because our immune system has the capability of rejuvenating itself. An aged immune system, what's called senescent immune system, um, is an immune system that's through the road of life collected a lot of injuries and scars, and it's not working quite up to what it should. And we often say, oh, as you get older, your immune system runs out of gas. No, your immune system doesn't run out of gas as you get older. What happens, it, it collects bad experiences. And those bad experiences, have to be rejuvenated. And there is a process in the body that allows that to occur. Most people don't know that every uh, second you're making hundreds of thousands of new uh, immune cells. In fact, every three months, you're completely remaking your immune cells in your body. And so the question is, are you remaking them to be as good, better, or worse than the ones that they're replacing? And so the process that we've been really focused on is how do you then use this natural process of immune rejuvenation so that you become younger in your immune system as you grow older in birthdays, not older. Now we have been studying immune age using various genetic markers now for the last couple of years. And we're surprised to learn that many people, I don't wanna say all people, but many people have immune systems whose age is far greater than their number of birthdays. So they may be 45 in age, but they may have a 70 year old immune system. And it's only within the last few years that this technology has become available. So you can actually start measuring what's called the immune age using these uh, uh, age clock determinations using uh, genetic uh, sequencing analysis. So we think that this concept is a breakaway concept to restore health to people that are previously unbeknownst to the fact that their immune system is not able to carry the weight and is carrying these scars and wounds and needs to be rejuvenated. And that's our whole focus. Now, that's such a critically important foundational concept to understand. What you said was that we have an entire new immune system every three months, that our bodies are continually rebuilding new immune cells. So the question is, is it an immune system that's functioning at the same level it was three months ago? or are you getting weaker or are you getting stronger? And as I understand, the, the, some of the determinant factors in creating an environment for a stronger immune system, um, I can think of two primaries, and please help me if there's others that are at this level of importance. One is what we're putting in to give the building blocks to build a new immune system. 
And the second is what's accumulated inside of us that may not be very good for us, like mercury or lead or organophosphates. So am I thinking along the right track that we want to be encouraging a little bit of detox, clean up the mess that's inside, while we're learning what are the foods and the, the supplements and support that we take from the outside in to give us the raw materials. Is that a rational approach for top two? Oh, Tom, I think that's brilliant. I think that, uh, you know, this, this word simplexity, where you take a bunch of complex stuff and you distill it down to the essence and making it simple and accessible, that's a simplexity concept that you just described. That is the, uh, that's the objective, uh, is to take away the bad stuff and give back the things that are necessary to rejuvenate the immune system. And by the way, and I want to give you again another shout out. This is one of these uh, moments of, of congratulation. You've been talking uh, for the last 10 years, and even before that, when we were doing seminars together, uh, about the link between autoimmunity and the conversion of a person's self into a non-self. You know, mm -hmm. often it's been said that that autoimmunity is to become allergic to yourself. And that never seemed very rational to me that suddenly a person would wake up some morning and they would say, their immune system would say, well, I don't like you anymore. I'm gonna become allergic to you. Um, even allergic to the genetic information from which you're composed, I'm gonna make antibodies against your DNA. It's like, now hold it just a minute. That's like the extreme example of uh, impunity is to say, uh, that you're going to become allergic to your genetic information. So all these many years, you and I have been speaking about maybe it's not self that we're becoming responsive to. Maybe it's self gets converted into non-self. Right. And then non-self is what our immune system recognizes. And just this March in Science Magazine, March 17th actually, is an article entitled Autoimmunity to the Modified Self. And what are the modifications that make self non-self? So that our immune system then sees us as a foreigner. It's things like gly glycation of proteins. Now, how does that happen? When you have a lot of sugar in your blood because you are eating sugar-rich diets and you don't have good blood sugar control, that sugar chemically reacts in with proteins to produce proteins that are not native to your body. They're foreigners. And now your immune system recognizes these glycated proteins as being foreigners and it produces antibodies to them. So your self becomes non-self and now you become autoimmune as a consequence of your blood sugar problem. Right. Now that's a modifiable factor, isn't it? If Easily. you get a person to eat the right diet, live the right lifestyle, their blood sugar levels are controlled, their A1C comes down and lo and behold, their immune system is functioning better. So these are examples of what you've been teaching that is really, when we started off 20 some years ago, kind of alien to the way that immunologists and allergists and rheumatologists were thinking about this, but now they're right in the center of the bullseye as to where the field is going. And we've been you know, teaching you that model. Thank you. And there, there are two points that I want, I want to bring up, this glycation thing. Um, uh, it produces what's called advanced glycation end products or ages. And what we now know is that these advanced glycation end products from too much sugar and it's being altered in your body, that they are the escort that takes beta amyloid into the brain. So we're all concerned about cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain. Well, the way the beta amyloid gets in, one of the primary ways is that piggybacks on advanced glycation end products. So as we lower the amount of ages, advanced glycation end products, we lower the amount of this beta amyloid that's getting pushed into the brain. That's the first thing I wanted to say because, whoa, that's important for everyone. And the second thing is that we now have these tools that we can use. And I know there's someone on your um, uh, Immunity Solutions Summit that talks about 
CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, and it's a nicotine patch. It's like a nicotine patch. You put it on your arm and then you take your phone and it'll tell you right now, what's your blood sugar? So when you eat something and you think it's good for you, but you check an hour later, your blood sugar is at 170, you say, whoa, well, that's supposed to be good for me. Well, <laughs> it's not for you, whatever the reason, but we have these monitors, these inexpensive monitors that you can use now to see how's your body handling the foods that you're eating from a blood sugar perspective. And that's the kind of experts that you have on your summit so that people have lots of really useful information that they can take home and begin applying. Well, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Um, as you know, and I think we've spoken about this in the past, I become a big proponent of this ancient food that's 4,000 years old called Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And by the way, just, oh, there, there it is. <laughs> you know, and I should say that there is no relationship to wheat at all. I don't know how it ever got that name, but it's not a member of the wheat family. It's gluten-free. It is not going to be even compared to a wheat or a cereal grain. Right. It's actually a fruit seed. So we uh, have been trying to find ways to make this more accessible to people so they can put it into their diet because it has such huge benefits on, uh, to health. And one of the things that we know is it, it has a very favorable effect on blood sugar. It lowers the uh, response of your blood sugar after eating. And it's, it's actually been used in traditional um, uh, Asian cuisine as a treatment for diabetes to, uh, to take uh, the Himalayan tartary buckwheat uh, flour. So we uh, put together a pancake and waffle mix with the Himalayan tartary buckwheat flour. And I, I decided I needed to really test its it's a blood sugar effect versus other gluten-free pancake and waffle mixes. And I could find 15 different commercial varieties of gluten-free pancake and waffle mix. So I made up um, this 100 grams of pancakes from each of those 15 plus the Himalayan tartary buckwheat version. And I consumed all 100 of those grams of those buckwheat pancakes or those pancakes over the course of about two weeks while I had a CGM on my arm. I did it actually twice, so I do it um, have a reproducibility. And I was amazed that some of those gluten-free pancake and waffle mix made my blood sugar go up like the Andes Mountains. I mean, it was just spiking so highly. But I was also so excited to see the same amount in grams of pancakes with the Himalayan tartary buckwheat, completely flat postprandial oh. blood sugar curve. Uh, no, amazing. no rising sugar. So th there is, uh, as you're just saying, a tremendous variation. People say, well, but hold on. They both have carbohydrates in them. Yes, but the carbohydrate in Himalayan tartary buckwheat is resistant starch. It has a whole different digestion and, and release factor than the highly metabolizable white starch. And so it basically smooths out the blood sugar curve um, over the course of several hours. So I think these are really, by the way, don't ever ask me to make pancakes again, because I think I consumed <laughs> like about a thousand pancakes over a couple of weeks, but uh, it was very illustrative. It, ta it taught me the lesson. You know, the reason that I have this here, Jeff, is because I believe so strongly now in this product in Himalayan tartary buckwheat. And I want to take a few minutes that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, um, uh, that as you have pointed out the studies on this, and I've read some of these studies, it's <laughs> jaw dropping how powerful a food this is. And I'm not sure if there is a more powerful food in terms of the amount of different polyphenols and beneficial nutrients that are in it. Marzi and I use it not quite every day, but probably three times a week, we'll use a little in something. You know, like if Marzi is breading some uh, pieces of chicken and she's using the Himalayan tartary buckwheat flour to do that. And sometimes she'll mix it with a little almond flour uh, or something. I, I don't know what she does, but they're delicious. Our son eats, a, eats them all up. And I'm so happy when I know we're eating products that are produced with this buckwheat flour, this specific 
type of buckwheat flour? Because it's so different. And I, and I want to ask you, what makes this different than other buckwheat flours? But before I do that, I just wanted to comment that I'm in the process of writing a paper now because I came across an article out of Italy published a year and a half ago. They looked at 116 different gluten-free breads or gluten-free pastas. And it was from nine countries, but 116 different products. And they measured the glycemic index of each of them, which means how much sugar your body thinks is in that food. And out of 116 different products, eight of them had low glycemic index. Every other one of them, it was through the roof. And that your body thought that you were eating pure Snickers bars when you're having gluten-free pasta, but it's made from corn. Uh, or it was made with rice and corn together, another one, that the glycemic index, what, how much sugar your body thinks you're eating right now, is altered dramatically for most people on gluten-free diets. That doesn't happen with Himalayan tartary buckwheat, as, as you've just shared. That just doesn't happen. So for our people here tonight, I want you just thinking about this thing about Himalayan tartary buckwheat and, and exploring some recipes with this. So well, the other thing, the other thing, Tom, that um, we're learning about is the unique uh, prebiotic fibers that are present in tartary buckwheat. It contains a very high level of a uh, substance called d chiroinositol DCI. Uh, d chiroinositol uh, has been shown in studies with women with polycystic ovary disease or syndrome to help to normalize their menstrual cycles and to lower PCOS because it has a favorable effect on their blood sugar and their inflammation in the ovaries. We also know that uh, this is very important for the formation of some of the friendly bugs in our gut, particularly Acromantia mesinophila, which is a very important uh, uh, microbe in our uh, um, intestinal microbiome that helps to protect our gut lining and to prevent dysbiosis and, and leaky gut. So we're really excited uh, that when you look at the whole seed, there are all these attributes that you were pointing out. And the, the, the flavonoids are 50 to 100 times higher than that in common buckwheat. So it's like a little biochemical factory making these extraordinary immune strengthening nutrients. And uh, I just can't believe that some 200 years ago, it, it got lost in America, that uh, this crop, which was um, brought over actually you know, by our colonial ancestors, because it's such a hardy crop and it doesn't require fertilizer or pesticides or herbicides or irrigation, it is very hardy, even grows in bad soils. Uh, somehow, uh, about 200 years ago, it was stopped uh, being cultivated. And uh, when we started getting interested in it uh, about three so years ago, we could find only one farmer in, in the United States that was actually still cultivating. It was uh, a former Cor Cor Cornell University uh, research ag professor and his wife, a nurse uh, in Angelica, New York, that had a little hobby farm that they were growing it from seeds that they got gotten from the USDA that ironically turned out to be seeds that they had gotten from the USDA from the Northern Himalayan regions, the so-called wild Himalayan tartary buckwheat, which has the highest level of these immune strengthening nutrients. So now we, um, now we're the owners of Angelica Farms <laughs> and, uh, and their equity. And uh, we're, we're now have an organic uh, group of farmers, regenerative agriculture, that's uh, uh, producing this for the first time for a couple hundred years in America. Wow, that's just marvelous. You know, you hear this story and um, you feel grateful and um, uh, honored to have access to this kind of food to feed your family. I've never thought about that before. This is the only product I've ever felt. Um, uh, I'm, of course, I'm grateful for organic farmers in the area and finding great foods, but uh, to find something so rare that now is being uh, developed and uh, more largely produced so that we all have access to it is just magical. We'll put a link in here for everyone to um, uh, just try it, just order a bag and try it, you know, yeah. and um, there are a number of recipes available. Our, 
is are there recipes available on your website for it? Yeah. Yes, we, we have a food lab. And, and actually, this is another part of your and my legacy, because this process that when we started getting serious about it, people that have been working with us for over 25 years decided to come out of retirement. So Barb Schultz now is our food lab person. Uh, Michelle Babb is our food lab person. Dr. Arthi Chandra. So these are people that, that have been in our lives for a long time that have come back to the action and are involved with recipe development and menu planning and so forth. That's just marvelous. Let's go to a couple of questions now. Uh, the first one from Michael on Facebook says, how best to preserve muscle mass during a parasite cleanse or fast? Well, I, I think the first thing to, to say is that if you have to give over a little bit of muscle mass in the process of eliminating embedded toxins, it probably is not a bad trade-off because you can build back your anabolic function very much more rapidly when you correct the poisoning of your metabolism. And so uh, I mean, it's all a degree. Certainly you don't want a person to be uh, ending, ending up with uh, cachexia and, and uh, in, end up with uh, serious um, loss of muscle mass. But I think that often you give a little to gain a lot more. And so it's, it's the proper balance, alkalizing your body, getting rid of acid metabolites, all of these things that you've spoken to so eloquently in your teaching. So uh, I would not be too worried as long as my BMI was improving and my percent body fat was going down. I would completely agree, of course, with my mentor uh, that it's a priority system. And, you know, Michael, I'm uh, smiling about your question because it was just today I was talking with someone who had just done a five day L Nutra program, which is a uh, uh, not complete fasting, but guided fasting. And uh, the, the question, and, and the fellow was saying that he noticed his blood sugar spiked a little bit every time he had the soup. And uh, he gave me the numbers and they weren't excessive, but there, there was a spike and none of the other foods were doing that. So I called the scientific director of El Nutra, Dr. Will Sue. Uh, he was in Boston, he's, he's in Cambridge. And I said, Will, tell me about this. Is this unusual? He said, no, 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 it's intentional. That the, the goal here is that you, you might set, now what Dr. Bland said takes absolute priority. The detoxing capabilities uh, are critically important to get the toxins out of there that are impacting on you. But the, they, they add a little bit of glycerin into the five-day protocol so that you're not in complete ketosis and you're not going to um, uh, burn muscle mass off of there, but this blood sugar alteration is intentional to protect the muscle mass. You may lose a little muscle mass if you have to detox and you, 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 and you don't want to be too aggressive and then you will rebuild <laughs> much, much quicker. But the concept of doing fasting, Michael, uh, if you look up El Nutra and their five-day program, it's a very safe. And um, when I asked for the science on it, Dr. Sue sent me 46 studies it took me about two hours to download them all and title them and put them in my files, 46 studies on how this works and why it works. So that was quite interesting. All right, Amal asks on Facebook, what do you do when IgGs remain low despite terrific adherence to organic diet, heavy metal detox and comprehensive vibrant microchip testing? Are some IgGs permanently burnt out? Thank you. Well, again, I, I would say it depends on what IgE being low really means. There is low in a normal range, and then there's clinically, pathologically low. So if your body's burden of neoantigens is, is reduced, your need for your immune system to produce a lot of Ig antibodies is reduced. So you might see a lowering of your IgG titer 
obviously with lowered exposure to neoantigens. Mm -hmm. So if you're speaking about low within a normal range, I would say that might be good. That mm -hmm. might be your outcome you're looking for. If you're talking about pathologic low, uh, as if you cannot mobilize an IgG response to a neoantigen, that's a that's a different story, and and that would be a suppressed immune system, and we probably think of that therapeutically in a different way. And do we have experts on the summit that are talking about um, uh, building uh, Ig levels or or monitoring Ig levels? Is that part of the information delivered uh, during the summit? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the Immunity Solutions Summit, we we've, we've got two people who are really, uh, I think, experts on this whole IgA, IgG, IgM, IgG relationship to immune function and what what those those values mean and how they relate to our lifestyle and our diet. So that is part of the uh, of the curriculum of the course. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Anne is on Zoom and she asks, besides the mitochondria, which seems to be exploding. What's next? <laughs> well, I, I think that <laughs> this is a very, very interesting question. Um, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who I have great respect for, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, his most recent of his three best-selling books is um, an incredible, incredible book called the, Song, the Songs of the Cell. And in that particular book, which was published late last year, uh, he describes the transition that we're undergoing in healthcare, moving from whole organism type of diagnosis, where diseases and maladies are really defined at a whole body macroscopic level using things like the microscope to see the body or the whatever. And he says the transition is that we're now recognizing that the power of health is really related to the function of cells and that there are several different hundred types of different cells. And the, the revolution that we're undergoing now is to be able to look at the architecture of the body, the song of cells, as it relates to how they participate in the function that gives us ultimately our health or disease patterns. Now, the reason I think that's an interesting transition is that then it begs the question, well, how do cells work? And cells work because they have their own little organs in them, organelles. The mitochondria and the energy powerhouse of the cell is one, but we have the Golgi apparatus, we have the lysosome, we have the endoplasmic reticulum. There are all these parts of the cell that we're now starting to recognize that are indicative of the function of the cell. Of the cell. So the intestinal tract of the cell or the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the liver of the cell is the, uh, the lysosome or, or the, the ribosome. And so we're starting to actually be able to understand um, health and disease at a much earlier level by looking upstream at the health of cells before we look at the disease of organisms. And, and this is a, a really interesting model because it now starts to um, introduce us to this theme that you and I have spoken to with so many of our colleagues, the epigenetic consequences. You know, we, we all were... Um, trained early on in our schooling that the epigenome did not ever change once you got past fetal development, because the rule of the law was that what happens if you could change the epigenetic information after development is that you might be a mess because all of your genes would be changing their messaging and that could be a catastrophe. But now we've learned that most of your genes, that's true, are fixed once you uh, become a oxygen breathing organism out in the real world post delivery. But there are still throughout all of our life selections of genes that are called metastable epithelials that are still capable of being epigenetically imprinted with experience. And a lot of those reside in our immune system. This is one of the reasons the immune system is so reflective of changes in our lifestyle and our environment. And so these epigenetic changes on cells then regulate how they function. And you can convert a very happy cell into an unhappy or unhappy cell, an angry cell, that then starts to change its personality by changing its gene expression patterns from a, a cell that is uh, 
having a blissful day to a cell that thinks it's under stress and now it's producing inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and all these, these um, substances that alert the body to being in harm's way. And so we're starting to, to have the ability to look way earlier now upstream of where these downstream diseases come from by looking at the personality of cells and particularly cells within the immune system. That's why we've been so fascinated with our Big World Health pro projects on the importance of the immune system as a, as a telltale for how all of our body is functioning. You know, as, as you were answering the question, I'm smiling inside because I remember so many years ago, you shared with me the video of Professor Linus Pauling when he was an elder statesman and he had this little beret on, this cute beret, you know, and he's talking about to understand the body, we must understand the organs. To understand the organs, we must understand the cells. To understand the cells, we must understand the atoms. You know, and he just went down and down and down. And we're saying the same thing now, 40 years later, we yeah. just more detail. But he was such a brilliant, brilliant thinker. Uh, yeah, I think now, now uh, if he were to be alive today, he would uh, he'd be say, saying something like, I told you so. Right. That, uh, <laughs> right. that we were just waiting for the tools to be able to validate what he and many others had been observing. Roger Williams is another example, the father of biochemical individuality is a concept. So yeah, I, I think that we're coming of age now yeah. with the ability to actually uh, answer some of the questions that you and I have been posed uh, and, and uh, flummoxed by over the last 30 or 40 years. Now we're able to really answer those questions so that we can become much more precise in helping people achieve their desired uh, outcome. Some of you may have noticed when Dr. Bland was answering that last question, I'm over here looking for something, I'm looking for a pen because I wrote down the song of the cell. This is a book that I need to read and I hope all of you are writing down the song. As a matter of fact, Anne will find the link on Amazon for it and she'll post it here for you. Uh, that would be a very interesting read to understand how do I keep my family healthier as we learn more and more about this world that my body is in. Tom, uh, Tom, let me just, let me say a quick thing uh, again that speaks to uh, uh, your leadership as as a uh, opinion leader. So, I have been impressed with uh, Dr. Mukherjee's work. He's a uh, oncologist, molecular biologist, um, uh, hematologist, triple boarded, triple degreed MD PhD, Harvard. Um, now he's at NYU, and uh, I always wanted him to come and, and give a presentation to one of our Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute meetings. I thought maybe it was a it was a reach because he's a very, very busy guy. But fortunately, a number of years ago, we were able to get him to come to our meeting. So he was then exposed to a lot of the things that, that you and I speak about as we were exposed to his thoughts. He then was gracious and came back a second time uh, to speak at our meeting. And in the second time when he came back, he, in his presentation, started talking about the fact that he now started to recognize how important managing blood sugar levels were within cancer patients, and that maybe they should be doing a lot more to study nutrition as it relates to blood sugar control in oncology. From that, then he crowdsourced research because he couldn't get the NIH to fund it, and he raised several million dollars crowdsourcing and formed a, um, a uh, collaboration with an investigator at Cornell to do an intervention trial that was government approved, looking at blood sugar control in, in oncology and, and outcome, starting to show in preliminary studies improved outcome in, in patients that were stage three and stage four cancer when they regulated blood sugar control carefully. And then that led most recently to him being a member of a company called Faith Therapeutics that is now putting together medical foods to treat oncology patients to manage their blood sugar. So it's often a circuitous route in which what we're saying weaves its way into the id of public knowledge and eventually can be policy changing. 
But I think it's really fascinating to see how these things that we've been speaking to have inherent truth to them and start to finally get people to listen. That uh, is a wonderful example, and it validates this concept of a CGM. I'm going to push this a little bit <clears throat> on our listeners because it's an inexpensive tool that you can use yourself to see how is my lifestyle affecting my blood sugar stability. And I believe each patch lasts about two weeks. I think right. that's about right. Mm -hmm. So you, you can do a month of this and you can learn so much about your favorite foods or your favorite beverages, your unsweetened iced tea that is sugar-free, but your, your blood sugar skyrockets afterwards. You know, um, all those types of experiences that no one can argue with. I mean, this is your body talking to you. So please consider a CGM uh, in your near future. Uh, Jane says, oddly, having green leafy and cruciferous vegetables seem to make autoimmune problems worse. Stopping eating them improves symptoms within days. This doesn't seem to make sense. Living in the UK, means that unfortunately we can't make use of any of your helpful tests to determine what's causing the problem. Yes, you can. Do you have any thoughts? Well, just on the test thing, yes, you can. Both Cyrex tests are available in London. I helped to get them there many years ago. Uh, the, the laboratory is Regenerous Labs and now Vibrant will ship to the UK. So Vibrant Wellness will shift. So you have access to the best tests in the world now. But to the other part of your question about green leafy and cruciferous vegetables, Dr. Bland? Well, I, I think that this is a really part of a, a emerging, uh, I was going to call it controversy, but let's just call it conversation about plant foods. Because there are some people that are now advocating lowering plant food intake because they're concerned about plant toxins. And they're saying that these plant anti-nutrients, let's, let's call them anti-nutrients versus toxins, uh, can have deleterious effects. Now, to make a very big story as time urgent as possible, I'll condense down my answer here. I've come to recognize this, as I know, Tom, you have as well, because you've spoken to this many times, that there is no single food that is tolerant for all people. We are much more heterogeneous in our response to our diet than we ever fully understood years ago. And this is in part related to the difference in our microbiome as it relates to also the difference in our body's own architecture. Our microbiome processes our food in its own unique way. And in so doing, it can produce as a consequence of secondary metabolites that come from our microbiome, things that uh, would inhibit or block certain aspects of our metabolism. So this is why precision or personalized nutrition, I think is so important. And, and, and you and I have both been advocating this for decades, sometimes against a lot of criticism. People kept uh, saying to me, they were saying, Jeff, you're making it too complicated just there are certain principles of a good diet, just have everybody eat a good diet and it'll all work its way out. Well, certainly there are principles of a good diet, no question about it. Uh, minimum process, close to the earth, those kind of things, uh, staying away from processed foods, high sugar, all those things are important. But that does not deal with the individual responses of certain foods to certain individuals. And um, you and I have both quoted a, a paper that was in The Lancet about 20 years ago by uh, um, a very well-known clinical immunologist at uh, Bartholomew Hospital in, in London, uh, uh, Dr. H.O. Hunter, in which he, uh, the title of the article was Food Allergy or Intro Metabolic Disorder? Question mark. And what he was raising is the question as to whether, uh, for a lot of people who think they have food allergies, do they have really just unique specific reactions intro metabolically, meaning the, uh, in, the in digestive system uh, an immune system that's associated with our digestive system, that they are uniquely responding to something in their food that other people do not. It might be histamine. You know, it might be uh, phenyl, uh, might be tyramine. It might be phenylethylamine, like in chocolate. A lot of people have problems with chocolate and get headaches because 
of phenylethylamine content in uh, cocoa. Other people have no problem with it at all because they can metabolize it with their liver quite readily. So I, the point I'm trying to make is this concept of should we cut out all the plant foods because they have anti-nutrients? My answer is no, we need to personalize our diet to those that we can in fact tolerate well based on our own unique, um, uh, both genetic and the microbial personality. I fully agree with that. And I, I would answer the question from two points. The first is about the microbiome. And I, I would suggest you consider the gut zoomer or a similar type of test to just evaluate what's the current <laughs> status of my microbiome. Uh, because our, our mutual friend and uh, recipient of the Linus Pauling Award, Professor Alessio Fasano at Harvard, who is always so careful of what he says, always. He published a paper a couple of years ago, solo, and the title of the paper says it all. All disease begins in the, quote, leaky gut, the role of zonulin, the protein zonulin, in the initiation of chronic inflammatory diseases. But all disease begins in the gut, and he's talking about the microbiome. So first, I would want to evaluate the microbiome. And the second is a study that just dropped my jaw in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It came out a couple of years ago. And I've talked about this before, that the editors of the journal said, this is an elegant study using sophisticated biomarkers to demonstrate their point. And Dr. Bland will tell you the editors of JAMA don't say that very often, you know, to give a stamp of approval. So what was this study that came out of Harvard? They looked at couples at assisted fertility centers and they ruled out, and they looked to see who was successful, who wasn't. And they ruled out many of the possible contributors such as smoking, being overweight, exercise, no exercise. And they isolated down to how many servings of fruits and vegetables they were eating a day and were they conventional or organic? And they, they categorized the amount of fruits and vegetables in fourths and quartiles, the lowest, the next, the third, and the highest. And the results were shocking, just shocking. The higher the amount of conventional fruits and vegetables you were eating, the less likelihood of successful implantation. And it was 18% less likelihood of successful getting pregnant with the more fruits and vegetables you were eating. But if you did get pregnant, it was a 26% less likelihood of a live birth. You had miscarriages and stillbirths. The more fruits and vegetables you ate, the worse the outcome if they were conventional. And those that were eating organic was the complete opposite. The more fruits and vegetables you were eating, the better the success rate. And they defined the organic category as eating organic foods three times per week, that it didn't even have to be every day. So two concepts here, check your gut microbiome and make sure you're doing organic because the amount of pesticides and toxins that are in our foods today are higher than ever before in history. I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think this is a this is a major area that's kind of below the radar screen right now, and um, yeah. it's it's scary. Uh, a study was published um, uh, last fall, looking across globally, um, sperm levels, sperm counts in males across uh, over thirty five countries, and showing over the course of Time, now this was decades, that there was a continued drop of about one to one and a half percent per year yeah. of sperm counts in males. And the conclusion of the article was very, very sobering. They said that if this were to continue at this rate of decline, by 2035, the majority of births would occur by IVF by in vitro fertilization. We would have started to so limit the reproductive viability of the human species by normal reproduction that we would require assistance for pregnancy. This is 
pretty scary. Not pretty. It's real scary. Very scary. And, um, you know, as I've gotten into this farming now with our organic uh, Himalayan tertiary buckwheat farmers, I am recognizing how passionate they are to bring this concept into their daily work. Regeneration of the soil, the mycorrhiza, the immune system of the soil, the immune system of the plant, the immune system of the people who eat the plant, and how that relates to their stewardship of their land. Um, we're very fortunate. We have uh, farmers that have been growing organically for over 20 years. So they, their whole uh, concept of stewardship, their whole concept of responsibility, their, their whole concept of pride in a product that's going to not only um, be nutritious, but be safe, is really, really a, a powerful guidepost for many of us. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Gigi asks the question, can we buy seeds to grow our own? No, we've, we've been very cautious to, uh, to kind of maintain our germplasm of our HTV seed. Uh, we, we don't want to get it hybridized. We want it to stay in its form. We, we feel pretty fortunate that we've landed on this very ancient seed. So we're, uh, we're protecting the gene plasm very carefully. Kelly's asking, will the Himalayan tartary buckwheat be processed in the future in a gluten-free facility? The package now says made in a facility that processes gluten. I do not want to purchase possible cross-contaminated items. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, we have a rigorous uh, gluten testing program uh, in our facility. They turn over the whole facility before they mill our product. And it has to be below the level uh, that is acceptable to label as gluten-free by the US FDA, USDA. So uh, this, this is part of our standard and procedures to make sure that uh, when we say gluten-free, it will fulfill those criteria. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Wendy asks, I have several friends who have been prescribed steroids to treat their illnesses. One has sarcoidosis. Are there alternative treatments given that these dampen the overall immune system and put them at risk of other diseases? Well, that's what you've been speaking to for the last uh, 20 plus years. Yeah. So I would say go to Tom O'Brien's lectures and his summit because you'll learn everything you, you might want to know about that. It's been also part of our Immunity Solutions Summit. We, we speak to this as well, but uh, I think that is a very, very powerful question with a powerful answer that comes from what we're advocating. Exactly. And Wendy, the link is already here for the Immunity Solutions Summit. We'll also put the link here for Betrayal, the autoimmune disease solution they're not telling you that we did a few years ago. And the answer is absolutely yes. That's the whole platform behind our work in functional medicine. Uh, Jill asks, my 33-year-old son has mono and has no idea how he got it. He eats no processed foods, exercises <laughs> regularly, and sleeps well. His glucose was 72 recently with his A1C 5.1. How could his immune system fail like this? He's typically extremely healthy. Well, re recall that one of the things that our immune system does all the time is it learns from the environment. Uh, an immune system that's working is not one that prevents every uh, infectious disease. It's one that manages infectious disease and builds antibody resistance. <laughs> and that's why we like kids to be rewild, to go out and to be in the forest and to play in the soil and, and to get exposed. We don't want them in an aseptic environment with an immune system that's never been adapted to anything. The, uh, the healthy immune system is one that's resilient because it's had experience and knows how to manage things well. So um, mono, which is you know a herpes type uh, virus, is not uh, something that uh, is necessarily bad if in fact the person is building an antibody res response and resilience. And uh, I, I would say on that one, uh, Jill, uh, remember what we just said about the impact of conventional fruits and vegetables, that the amount of toxic chemicals that are accumulating in the body now may put an emergency break on any function in our body. Well, I'm eating fruits and vegetables, lots of them. Yes, yes, but you've accumulated a lot of organophosphates. See, the test here tells us that you've got high levels of organophosphates in your system. So we need to get those out of there. So let's look at a detox. In other words, there may be a reason, or this may be a really good thing that's happening to build resilience for your son, one of the two. One more question, and then we have to go. 
Colon is this is Colin in Scotland, I believe. I have a friend who's now, yeah, this, this is Colin because he's in his mid to late 60s, if I remember correctly. I have a friend who is now 69, but was diagnosed with osteoporosis several years ago. But my question was, what was the cause? She was born with interception and as a result had her first surgery. She developed abdominal adhesions over the years had several life-saving operations, one of those for removal of gangrenous bowel. At 38, they removed both ovaries, which meant she required hormone patches. She was taken off these in her late 50s. It would seem evident that because of the bowel condition, she's not absorbing nutrients, but also because lack of estrogen because of hysterectomy, she's not producing hormones, which is a possible reason for osteoporosis. My question is, what can be done to help such people with multiple conditions? Well, I think that's a brilliant an an analysis. I would say good on you for putting that together so well. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, uh, obviously, there are things that can be done. There's a whole uh, multiphasic uh, management program for people that have hormone deficiencies and, and osteoporotic uh, changes in their in their bone with increased osteolytic uh, bone uh, damage. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I can give that to you in two seconds, but I can say that uh, Dr. Laura Pozzorno has a magnificent book called The Osteoporosis Solution that details hundreds of studies and gives a kind of a clinical approach towards modulating your bone regenerative capability. So uh, I might urge that as a, as a, cit a citation source. I agree. That was going to be my answer also. And we had Dr. Joe and Laura Pizzonero on the show uh, maybe seven, eight months ago uh, talking about their new book. It is an excellent book to give a big picture overview and then a lot of specifics as to what to do. Well, I've gone over again. Uh, it, it just goes so fast. Uh, for everyone here, please register for the Immunity Solution and as you've heard me say before, you don't have to watch every interview of every person, but you'll get the list of who is speaking, who that person is, and what's the topic they're talking about. And you may find, oh, oh, I've wondered about that. So you're going to tune into that one talk. That may be the only one you watch, but it may be the one that changes your life. So register for the event so that you can see who's going to be available to you, and then you'll choose as to whether you want to watch that one or not. And Dr. Jeffrey Bland, thank you so much for all you do in the world and uh, for being my friend, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Well, Dr. Tom O'Brien, right back at you for the four decades of friendship and your leadership. Um, there's still a lot of work for us to do, but it's Really wonderful to be in partnership with you. Thank you. Fully agree. Thank you.